Before he spoke creation, the God of heaven knew my name. Formed in his reflection, we are his glory on display. And his heart is good, he's always kind, his cross he drew, is by my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God, no matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart.
one more time. We are the sons. We are the sons. We are the daughters of God. No matter where we come, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. Perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in Perfect in all of your ways to end. You're perfect. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your One more time, you are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. To you. I've heard thousands. I've heard thousand stories of what they think in your life, but I've heard tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me just what we need before we say. Good 
good father to you are to you are to you are and I'm loved by you it's you who I am it's you who I am it's you who I am you guys take verse 2 you Because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am.
perfect in all of your ways. When our hearts are broken, you're perfect. When we're facing unbearable trials, you are perfect. When we're looking up the side of a big old mountain, you are perfect. You know, when we, when we get to that point where we're looking down and we feel like we've got the world conquered, you are perfect. We can give it to you. There's nothing that our our that that we can be a part of that you're not perfect in. Amen. Give him all the praise and the glory this morning. Well, good morning out there. Hello, everybody at Vineyard, everybody out there in online land. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're excited that you're here today after a big Buckeye victory yesterday, yeah. It was a great day for Marvin's, right? A great day for Marvin's. Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, was the star of the show for uh, the Buckeyes. A uh, reminder that we are continuing our fall book study, The Reason for God. Pastor Scott is going to share with us today from 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 7 through 18. So grab your Bible or your cell phone or your bulletin. Check out the scriptures. If you are new here, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are excited you've come to check us out, and we would like to greet you. So after the service in the second classroom, the middle classroom back in the fellowship hall, stop by for a little bit and get to know us a little more. Our food resource center is again open tomorrow. We need your help packing boxes or, or whatever. Sometimes it's boxes, sometimes it's bags, whatever, whatever. But we need your help from four to six Tomorrow and then on Tuesday, beginning at 11, we need volunteers in the pantry at 3 to give the food out. And 6, we really need volunteers to help clean up. What was I created for? Have you ever asked that question? What was I created for? Why am I here? Come to our class this Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30. Talk to Jim about signing up and with questions that's here at the church, I assume. Yes. So, all right. Yeah, here at the church, so... Don't forget, next Sunday, next Sunday, October 29th, come to the Vineyard for a chili cook-off and a football game with that other team in Ohio, you know, the Browns. <laughs> Again, uh, have some fun, bring some chili, show up to eat chili. The judging begins at 3. Uh, you're going to vote for first, second, third place in the chili cook-off trophies. 
Uh, that other team, the Browns, is supposed to uh, start about four, so please bring a snack, a drink, or a side to share. And uh, it was stopped for a while due to COVID issues, but we're back with our Harvest Festival this year, and it's such a blessing to the neighborhood. We do awesome things for the, the young uh, kids that come around, so we need your help. Uh, it's going to be from six to eight. We're going to have candy, fun, food, games, and we're looking for donations. You saw there's a box back in the lobby with some candy piled up, but we need some more, and we also need drinks, uh, juice boxes, water bottles, and snacks, so sign up to the lobby and help out as an alternative to that other holiday that's at the end of October. Show them what the Christians do. All right. It's time to kick off our Operation Christmas Child Box Collection, and Kathy O'Brien's going to come up here and share with us. All right. It's a wonderful way to start off our holiday season with the Operation Christmas Child. They've been doing this for 30 years. I know some of you do it every year. If you're new to this, you can ask me questions. There's a table in the back. Help yourself to whatever you like, and if, there, if we run out, I'll get more. Um, the collection date is going to be November 12th. And these shoe boxes go to kids all around the world, and they put the gospel of Jesus in each shoe box. So they said the most important thing with the shoe box is to pray for the child who receives it. Um, there's directions. There's certain things that you can't put in the shoe box. So on the boxes themselves, it gives you all that instruction. Um, and then there's a flyer. And you decide if you're going to give it to a boy or a girl, the different ages. And, um, and then they ask for a $10 donation for shipping. They would like for you to either do it online. If you do it online, you could follow your shoebox and see which country it goes to, or they give you a, a self-paid envelope to put your check in to mail the $10 in. And now we're going to watch a quick video. Three, two, when that shoebox is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoeboxes. They are so happy. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? Every year we see tens of thousands of children disciple. And we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. Pretty cool. I know that uh, our youth has done that in the past. I'm sure we'll continue to do it this year. What's kind of cool, again, as she said, you can trace and see exactly what country that your box is going to, which is kind of neat. And then you can pray for the child that gets it wherever it may be. And it's all over the world these go. Uh, went, one more thing, we need help, again, to take the chairs down and set up the tables after church today. So if you could stay after and help, that would be awesome. And don't forget today's offering and the little table in the back of the sanctuary. Also, again, don't forget your Build Back Better um, gifts that you do above and beyond your offering. There's so many needs in our church that we need to keep God's house in good shape. So God bless. Pastor Scott will be up with a message. Well, good morning. <clears throat> it's 
great to be with you today. Um, I had originally signed up to speak last week, and uh, because there was big news last week with uh, things that are happening in the church, uh, Brent asked if he could uh, preach last week, and I would preach this week, and I said, of course, and uh, so I'm glad to be here today uh, talking about a hard subject, uh, suffering. Uh, Jackie and I uh, oversee, uh, Jackie Brown and I oversee uh, small groups in the church, and if you want to know a secret, the secret is that Jackie's the brains behind all of that. <clears throat> uh, and Jackie sends out an email each week to the uh, small group leaders. Um, and as I read her email uh, last night, I, I thought, gee, I wish I'd read this earlier in the week. Um, but she talked about the fact that the, the first priority for Christians in many ways is to care for those who are in the midst of suffering. And then uh, she said in, in her email, she said, there is no one reason for suffering that the Bible singles out and says, this is it and nothing else. Uh, and then she wrote, so our faith is in who we know, is in what we know about the character of God, the goodness God, of God, and the sovereignty of God. And so I'm going to try to talk about some of those things today. And uh, thanks, Jackie, for a good introduction. Let's, let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you that in the midst of a hard, a hard world in which we live, a world in which suffering is a reality, uh, we know that the greater reality is God. And uh, we ask our Lord this morning that you would guide our thoughts and our hearts, help us to come to grips with life as we find it, and to know that in the midst of everything that we experience, you are right there, loving us and encouraging us and giving us strength and blessings. So be with us, we pray, as we think on these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, our scripture today is printed uh, in its entirety in the bulletin, so if you want to follow along on the bulletin, uh, you can do that. Hopefully, if I've got the slides in the right order, and I think I do, uh, they'll be up on the, on the slide also. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and uh, he says this, starting in 2 Corinthians, um, which is one of my favorite 66 books in the Bible. Um, but he says this, but we have, that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always be, being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us. Now listen to that. Isn't that a great promise? He will, the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us, present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. And then this last paragraph, which starts off with a wonderful therefore. Therefore, 
we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And thanks be to God for his miraculous and wonderful word. The study that we're doing uh, in the church is uh, the reason for God. And uh, one of the reasons for God in our lives is to give us hope in every area of life. If you can come up with a part of life that God doesn't touch and that God can't give you hope, I don't know what it would be. But it certainly includes hope even in suffering and disappointment. So, let's think on this together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hopelessness, there is God who gives us both hope and health and life and encouragement, even in the midst of everything else. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul says, though outwardly we are wasting away, and he just says that kind of as a passing, as a passing phrase, as if, well, everybody knows that. Uh, yeah, we all know. How many of you are in better shape now than you were 20 years ago? <laughs> One hand. All right. Good. That, that, that's, that's good. Uh, I wish I could raise my hand on that one, but I can't. Um, because we all experience, in one way or another, we all experience suffering. Our bodies um, are not as good today as they were 20 years ago, perhaps. Maybe yours is better, and that can happen. But suffering in our, in our bodies, our hearts, our skills. You know, I, I play the, uh, the cornet and the trumpet. And uh, I was at my peak around 18 to 22. I was a trumpet major in college. I was practicing four hours a day. I was taking professional lessons from a, from a great, great trumpet player. Um, I got pretty darn good. Formerly. I used to be that good. I'm not that much anymore. I'm still decent, but I can, I can, I can and I play in a brass band, and I can tell, uh, you know, I, I don't sit on the front row anymore. Um, nor should I, because there are people with far more uh, talent and expertise now than I have, and that's fine. Uh, our bodies take a hit, our hearts take a hit, our skills take a hit, our abilities take a, take a hit. Maybe peace has taken a hit in your life. I hope not, but it might have. But it should be no surprise to us when we realize that there are things in life that change not always for the better. Certainly true in our world today. Two weeks ago yesterday, on a beautiful Sabbath, the face and fury of evil, suffering, and death was set loose in southern Israel. And it continues. Out of the blue, out of the blue skies, out of people just going about their life, 
some kids that or some people at a at a rock concert, some people doing whatever, many worshiping, and out of all of that came death and destruction. And it continues even today, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in, in a few minutes. But think about the inevitability of suffering. All these diseases, and you know, modern medicine has made tremendous strides. I thank God for the hospitals and the and the nurses and the the the, the, the people who, who work with our bodies and help us, but still, you know. The, the world got shut down a, a few years ago by COVID. Who was expecting that? None of us. All these diseases, and we, and, and we get better at some, and something else pops up. The inevitability of suffering physically, and then there's all these acts of, of, of evil. Uh, people murdered on the street. Uh, people... Murdered in their homes. People whose resources and money and fortunes are stolen. And then all these accidents. And you know, we have seat belts and we have airbags and we have all sorts of things, but people still die on the roads. And in Accidents at work and accidents at home. You know, I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, uh, but it's it's true that we live in a world that is where the there's almost an inevitability of suffering, and then wars and acts of terrorism, and we as Americans know that while we used to kind of think we were immune after 9-11, never again. And, and Paul just says while we were wasting away, like, you know, it's, it, you know, don't be surprised. It's there. In a fallen world, because of sin, don't be surprised when things go terribly wrong. I think that's a, that, that, that's a fair thing to say. So, let's think about suffering. There's a question, of course, that, that gets raised every once in a while. Shouldn't believers in God Almighty, shouldn't believers be spared all this suffering? And there are, the, you, know, you can hear from certain pulpits around the world, you can hear people saying, you know, if you believe in God, everything's going to get better. And your life's going to be wonderful, and, you know, suffering will be a thing of the past, and poverty will be a thing of the past, and, and all of that. That was not Paul speaking those words. In fact, I want to read a little bit about, from Paul, um, this is taken in from chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Corinthians. In chapter 11, uh, you know, he, he, he talks about some of his past and accomplishments and some of that. He said, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. This is not on a screen, by the way, so if you're looking for it, it's not there. Um, are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked hard, much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. 
That's why they call them lucky. No. No. Sorry. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. Was Paul familiar with suffering? Yeah, he was. And then in the next chapter, in chapter 12, um, he says, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. But then a few minutes later, he says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, to torment me. And we do not know what that was. And I think it's probably just as well. Uh, because we all have thorns in the flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from, to take it away from me. But the Lord said to me, quote, and hear this, the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You might say, but if you're a believer, those things shouldn't be happening to you, right? What would Paul say? If God is with me, that shouldn't, this shouldn't be happening, right? And so the question is, why does God allow suffering? And I wish I had an easy answer, but I don't. So if you, if you came here today and said, finally, somebody's going to tell us why suffering happens, and at least I'll have that, that question solved. I can't give you the answer, except we know that through suffering, we have, we have, to, we have to deal with faith, we have to deal with suffering through faith. The only way we can deal with the things that, that happen to us in life sometimes are through faith. Paul says, therefore do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Th- think about what he just said. He said, the troubles that you have right now and the troubles that you've experienced in your life are one day going to be outweighed by, by glory. That is an amazing promise. To put it another way, you know, the, there's, there's lots of similarities between some of the things that Paul says in, in the two Corinthian books and in Romans. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And many of us, I think, would be quick to jump up and say, now wait a minute, Paul. You don't know what I've, what I've experienced. You don't know the suffering that I've had in my life. It's been terrible. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. One of the promises that God gives us is that when we, when we are in heaven with God, in some God way, many things are going to be a, 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 just a dim memory for us due to the glory that we are experiencing there. 
That is, we can talk about sufferings and glory, and that our present sufferings will be overcome by the future glory. Now that's a that, 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 that's a working premise that, that a lot of people uh, accept every day. You know, you work now so that you can retire later. You know, you that there are, you you go through things now so that it'll get better later. And what the Bible teaches us, I think, is that the whatever sufferings we have now. And I'm not minimizing or diminishing them in any way. One day there will be a future glory. And many of these sufferings and many of these hardships will become a distant memory. Do I fully understand this? Absolutely not. But I believe it with all my heart and with all my mind and all my soul and all my strength. Remember what Paul says in in verse 8, he says, we are, uh, of our scripture today, we are hard-pressed on every side. You ever felt like that? We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And sometimes relief from the suffering comes from the people around us. Sometimes God will send the glory into your life. Um, well, what do we do about the future of suffering? We can't avoid it. No matter how, how well you insulate yourself, from the, you know, there's a guy. There's a guy right now. He has spent millions of dollars trying to preserve his body and keep it at peak performance for as long. He wants to live forever. Uh, he, he he's got this gruesome regimen where he he's he's done eating, if you can call what the the stuff that he's the green stuff that he's drinking and, and all that. Uh, he's done eating by 11 o'clock in the morning, and he does all these exercises, and he takes all these pills, and he's got all these scientists helping him. But try as we might, and try as he might, there is going to come a day when things start to break down in his body. Just ask Brent. Brent, have you ever experienced anything wrong in your body? No. You, you've never told us. You, you've never told us, so, so, so okay. Yeah. Well, your soul, your soul is, for sure. All right. Uh, but we do not lose heart because we have faith in a God who's going to be with us forever. So, whenever I've preached here, I've I've uh, come toward the end of the sermon and, I, and I've asked the question, yeah, but so what? Yeah, but so what? So let's think about this for a minute. We are 15 days into the war in Israel. As of this last Friday, the statistics that I saw said between Israel in Gaza, over 5,000 people have already died in the last two weeks. More than 15,000 have been injured, and those two numbers are both going to go up. The inevitability of suffering continues. Some days... We don't know if we can go on or not. And the answer to that is 
but God. It's one of my favorite phrases. You can list everything that's going wrong in the, in the world and let your next sentence be, but God. But God is with me. But God gives me strength. But God loves me. But God has surrounded me with people who love me. But God has given me the church. But God has given me a Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen and amen. C.S. Lewis uh, said this in one of his books. He wrote, At present we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of the morning, but they do not, they do not make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors that we see, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. So with all of that said, here's, here's what I believe. I believe that one day, there will be a great reunion with my son Aaron. You, I've, I've told you all about Aaron before. But one day, because I believe in heaven and because I believe in a God who loves us all, there will be a great reunion with my son and with my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents, who I never met, and my great greats, and, and, and on and on it goes. There's going to come a day when I get to talk to Abraham and, Mos and Moses and Ruth and David and Isaiah and the disciples and Gabriel with his horn. I'm going to ask him for lessons. <clears throat> and John Wesley and John Wimber, who you guys had a chance to meet, but I didn't. And Martin Luther King from centuries ago. And Martin Luther King Jr. from last century in my lifetime. And Jesus face to face. The suffering and the misery of this world will pass away and be forgotten, I think, from what, from, from what I read. Right at the end of the book, the big black book, Revelation chapter 21 it's that, that chapter starts off with these words, which are going to be our closing words. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, look. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Why is there suffering? I don't know. But what I do know that suffering can draw us closer to God. Because we only get through this life 
with faith in with faith in Jesus, with faith in God, with faith in the Holy Spirit, and that God will give us the strength to go on. And he'll get us through this life. And there's a far greater one waiting for us one day. Uh, thanks be to God. Thanks be to Jesus. Thanks be to the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to all of you for encouraging one another and encouraging us to go on. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you. Not as we suffer. We don't thank you for the suffering, but we thank you that it is a reminder of how much we need you in our life. And it is a reminder of that one day the future glory will surpass any suffering we've experienced here. And we believe that with all of our hearts. And so, Lord, help us in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hard times, in the midst of life which has its great days and its hard days. Help us to remember to put our faith in you. And life will get better as we spend eternal life with you. Bless us. Keep us always in your care. Give us hope. Give us joy. Give us peace. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are done with the service. Uh, we always have time up uh, for, for prayer up here. If you would like to pray, uh, Brent has a t-shirt on that says he is currently unsupervised. Uh, <laughs> and that's good uh, because the Holy Spirit set loose in him and in all of us. We invite you for prayer. May God be with you today. Amen.